Daily news and analysis. We keep you informed and inspired. This is World Today. Hello and welcome to World Today. I'm Ding Han in Beijing. Coming up, China pledges to forge closer ties with Fiji for Ocean of Peace. The European Union is moving to adjust some of the planned tariffs on Chinese-made EVs. Azerbaijan applies to join the BRICS grouping, and China is calling on Libyan leaders to create necessary conditions for resolving political crises in the African country. To listen to this episode again, or to catch up on our previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching "World Today." Chinese President Xi Jinping has pledged that China will continue to provide assistance for Fiji's development and promote the building of a China-Fiji community with a shared future. The Chinese leader met with Fiji's、uh, Prime Minister Sitivani Rabuka here in Beijing on Tuesday, saying that China is ready to help Fiji and other Pacific Island countries cope with climate change. And for his part, Prime Minister Rabuka said Fiji is willing to strengthen cooperation with China in poverty alleviation and continue with the Belt and Road cooperation. The Fijian leader has had a 10-day official visit to China. So joining us now on the line is Chen Xi, Assistant to Executive Director of the Asia Pacific Study Center, East China Normal University. So thank you very much for joining us today, Chen Xi. Um, among the areas where China and Fiji have agreed to strengthen their cooperation are tourism, agriculture, fishery, infrastructure, etc., etc. So, what do you think is really driving China to move to forge closer ties with Fiji? Some people say it's because Fiji's geographic location is somehow strategically important to China. Do you see it that way? Yeah, so、um, we know that the, both Fiji and China,、uh, these two countries, are developing countries. So the development of this cooperation has actually been based on what China is capable to provide, and also what Fiji really needs. So for these two countries, they both belong to the global south, though one is a very large country and one another one, the other side is a very small country in terms of the population as well as the、um, size of the economy. But in nearly like 50 years' time, the two countries have actually expanded cooperation in many areas, which has proved to be a very、uh, well-win cooperation. When we say that Fiji is very small, like in terms of、um, the global south, but actually Fiji is a very big country in Pacific Island community.、Mm. So、um, the cooperation between like China and Fiji, these two countries, will also serve as a、uh, very good example for the cooperation between China and Pacific Island countries in the future as well. Hmm. So in 2018, Fiji signed a memorandum of understanding on Belt and Road cooperation with China. Uh, since then, over the years, what do you think the BRI has brought to Fiji? Yeah. So、uh, the most prominent is that the economic and trade partnership between China and Fiji has been on a very fast track ever since then, and China now has. Already become Fiji's、uh, fifth largest trading partner, with the annual trade volume last year reaching more than five five hundred million dollars. So, and also besides this、uh, memorandum, and also Fiji also support a series of China's global initiatives. So,、uh, Fiji as the largest island country in the South Pacific region, it also has a very you know very active economic development needs. So, these economic cooperation、um, and also the assistance. From China is a key area for the country to deepen their cooperation and in the future. And we all know that during the past decades, two countries have already cooperated in many areas and have achieved very great results, including like、um, infrastructure, construction,、um, as well as agricultural cooperation. Hmm. So when we talk about China helping Fiji、uh, to tackle the the impact of climate change, what exactly、mm-hmm. do you think China is able to contribute in this domain? Yeah. So、uh, when we say about co-、uh, climate change, so actually the cooperation in this regard. Uh, has always been carried out mainly in two aspects. So the first one is when Pacific 
island countries, including Fiji, um, were hit by extreme natural disasters, China would be the first one to immediately or offer you know very urgent needed supplies and also uh, relief funds to these affected countries but also on the other hand it is more important for for china to help fiji and other countries to build up their capacity to withstand the disasters including you know um, improving the infrastructure and also carrying out technical cooperation in organizing um, education and training programs so as to effectively help Pacific Island countries to improve their climate um, adaptation and disaster resilience. And when we talk about infrastructure, actually what we are referring uh, referring to, uh, the help from China, mm. is to assist um, these countries to carry out the infrastructure construction um, projects uh, related to climate change, including like improving the um, local water and electricity supply um, and also the general, you know, the infrastructure uh, conditions. And also another very important area is th about the um, disaster warning system. So China has continued to support the construction of earthquake and also tsunami early warning and monitoring networks um, in order to improve the general uh, capacity of Pacific Island countries to prevent the very severe influence brought by um, disasters like earthquakes, um, tsunami and other natural disasters. And this is exactly in accordance with the actual needs of island countries. And also the um, we, we know that the people, the, the professionals are very important for, for, for countries to tackle with these challenges. But there is a very um, apparent shortage of professionals in the field of climate change in Fiji and other Pacific Island countries. So in this area, China has provided scholarships and also training programs to improve the ability of, of these professionals in these countries um, to improve their capacity to cope with um, the climate change. So in all these areas, actually, China has been helping Fiji and other countries to tackle with, you know, the influence brought by the climate change. Mm, so all in all, the assistance provided by the Chinese side can be said to be uh, very multifaceted, I guess. Mm, now, apart yeah. from uh, Beijing, uh, the Chinese capital city, uh, we understand uh, Prime Minister Rabuka's 10-day tour of China this time around has also taken him to the Yunnan province, Fujian province, mm. and Zhejiang province. Uh, and he told uh, President Xi Jinping on Tuesday that Fiji is willing to learn from China's experience. So what kind of experience from China's development do you think might be useful or inspirational to Fiji? Yeah. Uh, so for uh, for the first thing I would like to point out is um, uh, Rebecca's travel to these uh, three provinces. This travel itself um, indicates a deepening of the bilateral relationship between Fiji and China, uh, meaning that the both sides would like to move beyond, you know, uh, merely the, the the formality between leaders, and also. Both sides would like to turn this cooperation and relationship into a um, substantial impetus for enhanced cooperation between two countries in, in, in the future. And in terms of China, actually China, we all know that China has made great efforts in reaching out to the local communities. And for the county uh, Rebuka visited this time in Yunnan was actually once a very um, poverty-stricken county. So this visit aims to gain insights from China's successful efforts in combating poverty, which is highly related to the modernization as well as the developed needs of, of Fiji. Mm. So we know that Fiji is a um, is an island country rich in um, agricultural as well as fishery resources, but affected by climate change for quite a long time. So um, this visit includes uh, include the areas such as like agricultural and fishery development, and also the port construction, shipbuilding, um, tourism, and even the the, the grain um, development. And all these areas that the Fiji government has has attached great importance to. And you know these areas will be the area that two countries will 
uh, further collaborate in the future. And what we say, we just mentioned about the um, impact of the climate change. And also, you know, that climate change, the impact is another factor hindering Fiji's economic development. And it poses a very great threat to not only survival, but also the economic development. So this is actually another area that is very important for economic development. And also mm. in the process, we say um, to build a blue Pacific, the two countries have great potential for cooperation in such areas as um, green economy and clean energy, for example, the um, seawater desalination. So China will be able to use its technological advantage to help improve um, the well-being and economic level of, of, of Fiji and other uh, Pacific countries. Hmm. So since uh, Mr. Rabuka returned as the Prime Minister of Fiji uh, back in the year 2022, he has proposed an ocean of peace foreign policy to regional Pacific leaders, which is really envisioning a kind of scenario where regional countries would try to avoid militarization of their region. Now, President Xi Jinping on Tuesday told Rabuka that China is ready to strengthen cooperation with Fiji and other Pacific Island countries to make the Pacific Ocean an ocean of peace, friendship, and cooperation. So why do you think um, here the Chinese leader has sent a message that uh, sounds very supportive to uh, Prime Minister Rabuka's ocean of peace foreign policy. Yes, so one of the consensus both sides um, have, have, have reached is that the Pacific Ocean should be an ocean of peace, friendship and cooperation, um, not a space for any kind of competition or um, confrontation. And for China, in Conducting cooperation with Fiji and also other island countries, um, the principle of full respect has always been the principle that China has been adhering to. Chinese government has always been very committed to fully um, respect the sovereignty and independence of the island countries, fully respect the wishes of island countries, fully respect the cultural traditions of island nations, as well as the strengths of island countries through unity. And this is the most important important the principle that has supported the development of the bilateral cooperation for decades time already and it will always be the principle and the most important thing for both countries to further develop their cooperation in the future. Mm. So with what you have uh, previously talked about in mind, frankly speaking, do you think there were any signs that China is seeking to uh, either militarize the Pacific Islands region or pushing countries in that region to pick sides between major powers. I'm asking this question because it seems sometimes that is an acquisition against China from uh, certain countries. Let's put it this way. Yeah, so... Um in nature, China's cooperation with Fiji and other Pacific countries has never been transactional, but focusing on the real needs of these countries, which are economic development, poverty alleviation, um, and also the combating climate change. So China respects the cooperation between the West and the island countries, and also the West should also respect the cooperation between the Pacific island countries and China. These two are not mutually exclusive. And China's cooperation with Pacific Island countries is not targeted at any third country. And we always actually welcome the participation of third country, be they the United States or Australia or Japan or any other country. And China is very happy to see the success of anything that is conducive to the development of, of, of island nations. So China is always ready to work with more countries to address the survival problems faced by all, all Pacific Island countries, actually also China. So for the South Pacific Island countries, they have a very clear desire to pursue development and stability. So we, we, we firmly believe that for all Pacific Island nations, they have sufficient political wisdom to make very clear judgment based on their own country's long-term interests. Mm. Thank you very much for joining us. That was Chen Xi, Assistant to Executive Director of the Asia-Pacific Studies Center, East China Normal University. You're listening to World Today. We'll be back.
You are listening to World Today. I'm Ding Hen in Beijing. The European Union has adjusted its planned tariffs against the Chinese-made electric vehicles following what the European Commission says is a thorough investigation. This particular decision comes two months after the bloc imposed the tariffs on all EV imports from China. Chinese automakers BYD, Geely, and SAIC have all seen their tariff rates slightly lowered. Tariff on Tesla's China-made cars has been reduced to nine percent from the previous twenty percent. However, other companies cooperating with the EU's anti-subsidy investigation will face a slightly higher tariff than the previous rate. China's Commerce Ministry said on Tuesday that it opposes the EU's ruling, vowing to defend the legitimate rights and interests of Chinese companies. China has opened an anti-subsidy probe into dairy products imported from the EU. So joining us now on the line is Andy Mark, senior research fellow with the Center for China and Globalization. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure is always being on. So, what is your main takeaway from the adjustments that has been made on the EU side? Are we talking about a technical revision or a shift in terms of the EU's、uh, position on China-made EVs? Well, I think if we look at the actual numbers,、uh, they probably suggest it's more of a so-called technical revision versus any substantive. Policy change.、Mm. Um, the numbers I've seen are, as you mentioned, Ding Hong, that、uh, Tesla has Tesla's、uh, tariff has been reduced to nine percent.、Um, BYD has gone down from seventeen point four to seventeen. Geely from nineteen point nine to nineteen point three. SAIC、uh, from thirty seven point six to thirty six point three.、Uh, so on and so forth. So these are not very significant decreases. So,、um, given that, and I think you know what we know at this point, I don't think it certainly would be right to call it any kind of substantive policy shift.、Mm. So, what do you think is the most fundamental factor driving the EU to slap、uh, tariffs、um, against the Chinese-made EVs? Well, I think that it is、uh, because of a misguided. Uh, desire to protect、uh, the European Union's、uh, domestic EV industry, but I think we have to recognize here that just from an economic theory perspective,、uh, you know, we can think back to someone named David Ricardo and his、uh, notion of comparative advantage. That it's actually better off、uh, for countries、um, to trade with ones that have. Uh, an advantage, as I think China does in this case,、uh, with electric vehicles. So not just in technology, but in the ability to manufacture, arguably even the ability to design and distribute、mm. uh, as well. That this、uh, is really better off、uh, for the European、uh, political entity as a whole.、Um, and I think what's happening here with these、uh, tariffs. Is that they're really saying, look, we are going to punish innovation, because I think few would dispute this idea that、uh, China clearly is in the lead with battery technology,、uh, with most of the manufacturing process, even with the branding and and the、uh, product design as well. So one, I think this is punishing innovation, and ultimately,、um, if these tariffs.、Uh, Do stand.、Uh, they ultimately、uh, punish European consumers, who will have less choice and pay more for what is seen as an increasingly vital、uh, product,、mm-hmm. which is、um, transportation in a more environmentally sustainable way. Okay. So, are we、um, basically seeing a further escalation in terms of the trade conflict between the EU and China? Well, I think unfortunately, it certainly seems to be looming.、Um, you know, we've seen、uh, China make some pretty clear, strong statements、uh, about its view on, on this,、um, and we may see, you know, further action to follow those words. And you know, we talked, Ding Hong, just about the economic implications. There's also the environmental implications as well, which we touched on,、um, and this may actually foment a backlash. In the EU, because we mustn't forget 
there are a significant uh, percentage of the, of the population of the EU that cares very deeply uh, about environmental sustainability issues, and I think certainly are very troubled uh, by this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then finally, as we're talking about now, um, you know, this certainly can uh, make the trade relationship between China and the EU more difficult, and it even has the possibility of impacting the broader overall relationship as well. Mm. Um, the EU was China's second biggest source of dairy products, was about 36% of the total value of China's imports last year, behind only New Zealand, according to China's official data. Um, in addition to dairy products, we understand China's anti-subsidy uh, probing tool has also previously targeted pork and wine imported from the EU. That is somehow relevant to this uh, response to the EU's um, action against the Chinese EVs. I mean, for products like dairy, pork, and wine, this kind of um, products, there seems to be plenty of other economies or countries where Chinese um, importers can buy from as alternative. Then with regard to the EV, of course, like you mentioned earlier, Andy, there is significant market demand over there in the EU. So uh, with regard to the EV, are there enough alternative to Chinese-made cars that can meet the actual market demand over there in the EU? No, I think that you raise a very good point, Ding Hung. Certainly, we've seen in the last few years uh, how quickly Chinese uh, enterprises, whether that's BYD, Xpeng, NIO, you know, probably a host of many others, uh, that are really uh, taking leadership, again, not just in technology, um, but in design and in uh, cost competitiveness and quality as well. So I think that perhaps the answer might be uh, there are not a whole lot of other viable options that check all of those boxes. And so I think, again, you know, one of the dangers um, that EU officials run in pursuing this policy is not only a backlash um, from those committed to environmental sustainability, but even a much larger percentage uh, of people and perhaps even companies that care about access to affordable uh, mobility solutions, you know, which, of course, um, electric vehicles are an increasingly growing part of that. Mm. So, Andy, we still have about like one minute before we need to finish today's discussion with you. So the final question before we let you go, do you think the terrorists from the U.S. side as well as the EU side will fundamentally alter the momentum of China's electric car imports, uh, exports rather, not imports? Well, I think the short answer is uh, not too much in the long run. So in the short term, of course, um, if tariffs are raised high enough um, in the U.S. or in the EU, that certainly can have an impact on short-term sales. But I think we also have to recognize uh, that demand for any product uh, must be satisfied uh, somehow. And with market forces, I think that uh, this could slow down the development of the exports of uh, mm. Chinese EVs globally, but uh, certainly will not uh, stop them in the long run. Thank you very much for joining us. That was Andy Mock, Senior Research Fellow with the Center for China and Globalization. Coming up, Azerbaijan applies to join the BRICS, and China calls on Libyan leaders to create conditions for resolving political crisis. You are listening to World Today. We'll be back after a short break. Welcome. I'm Ilaf Elard, economics professor and member of the Data Science and AI Center at New York University, Shanghai. On the World Today program, you can find in-depth and impartial insight, as well as critical commentary on key trends in the Chinese economy, financial technology, business, and blockchain. To prepare for the world tomorrow, join me on World Today. You're listening to World Today. I'm Ding Han in Beijing. 
Inflation in the eurozone rose slightly in July, reaching 2.6 percent. The single currency hit a nine-month high against the U.S. dollar. These figures are dampening hope that the European Central Bank might cut interest rates next month. In the meantime, the eurozone's overall economy grew by 0.3 percent in the second quarter of this year, with its leading economy Germany unexpectedly shrinking by 0.1 percent. So, for more on these figures and the overall EU economy, my colleague Zhao Yang spoke with Professor Chu Qiang from Mingzhu University of China. So, Professor Chu, inflation in the eurozone rose slightly in July to 2.6 percent, with the single currency hitting a nine-month high against the U.S. dollar. So, how do you view the eurozone economy so far this year? Well, I think the eurozone economy is still in the、uh, sluggish phase.、Uh, on one hand, I think.、Um, Inflation has already been contained, but not fully contained.、Uh, inflation, according to our experience and observation and history, can be, you know, very tricky. Sometimes you think you got them, but uh, uh, when you just、uh, lose your, you know, caution, and then they come back to you immediately.、Uh, that happens in America and in Japan and in、uh, European Union, like for many times. So、uh, we're glad to see that inflation has been lowering. Or stabilizing, but、uh, sometimes we still need to be very cautious to see whether they're going to return or not.、Mm. And also talking about、uh, inflation, and more importantly, we need to talk about this economy. Well, the major economy in eurozone is、uh, very slow, especially the double engine in the eurozone area,、uh, Germany and France.、Uh, they probably recorded lowest the activity of economy in the past、uh, three、uh, months. So、uh, this can be a very important problem because、uh, without Germany and France, especially、uh, also we plus、uh, Italy, Italy, and、uh, we're going to see that the whole eurozone doesn't have a very promising year of twenty twenty four. So I think that can not, that can affect not only eurozone area but also can be a problem for the world supply chain. Mm. And some people say that the inflation figures have dampened the hopes that the European Central Bank might cut the interest rate next month.、So、what do you think about that? Oh yes, I think they can and they should、uh, cut the interest rate further because、uh, I think for all the central banks,、uh, they need to consider two very important,、uh, you know, target of the policy.、Uh, number one is、uh, employment. Number two is the、uh, overall price level. So I think for the price level right now in the eurozone has already been contained or stabilizing, but the employment issue as well as you know for the growth because of growth of economy actually will lead to、uh, more of the employment. So、uh, when employment issue、uh, came to you know priority for the euro、uh, bankers,、um, right now I think they should lower the interest rate to boost the economy. Otherwise, I think. Eurozone is just in the、uh, eve of a further and a deepened recession.、Mm. And talking about the real economy of the eurozone's largest economy, Germany, actually it shrank by zero point one percent in the second quarter of this year. Its GDP. So, what are the main challenges the、uh, German economy is facing right now? Well, Germany is probably the most important economy in the whole eurozone.、Uh, but I think、uh, the challenge faced by Germany is probably everybody can see very outstanding.、Uh, number one, I think, is the uh, uh, Ukraine crisis. The conflict has actually been uh, uh, affecting the whole supply chain uh, in the uh, from the energy to the transportation to the labor forces. And etc. You have to understand that you、uh, that Russia used to be the largest and most important energy supplier for Germany. So the cheap energy plus the efficient、uh, manufacturing sector of the Germany plus together becomes a very important driving force for the European Union. But right now, this double pillar has been you know chopped off by one. So the cheap、uh, oil and gas is just long gone. So Germany need to revitalize its energy sectors, or trying to find another way to power up their, you know, manufacturing sector. So this can be a very, you know, difficult job. Secondly, they have a lot of labor forces from,、uh, you know, the Eastern Europe,、uh, European zone, or from the、uh, middle、uh, European area. 
But right now, because of the conflicts, so uh, lots of the labor forces cannot, you know, find a right way to get into the Germany market. And thirdly, it's important is Americans' uh, monetary policy, the high interest rate by Federal Reserve, are forcing the ECB also to rise up the interest rate. So the high interest rate environment actually are killing the vitality in a financial sector as well as the real economy of Germany, you know, at the same time as well as they facing some domestic challenges, uh, for example, immigration. So all these things are disturbing Germany as very important economic hub in a European uh, Union. And we've seen the direct investment from Germany to China maintain a very good momentum. And according to the data from the Central Bank of Germany, the country's FDI to China came in at 7.3 billion euros. This is more than the same period in the year 2023. So what do you think are the main drivers of this kind of uh, trade and investment relationship? Well, this I think uh, the math is very simple. Just take a look. How Germany or further, uh, you know, European uh, multinational companies, those giants, are making money? Are they selling their products like the electronics, mechanics, and the cars to Europe? I don't think so because their infrastructure are done. They're a very mature economy. Their demographic structures are very old, and uh, uh, the uh, most of the high tech, uh, you know, uh, unicorns and the gross point are in America, and America wouldn't let go and allow European countries to, you know, get a finger over this new gross point. And right now, most of these companies like the BMW, Mercedes, ABB, Schneider, they're selling their product to China, to Asian, to this growing market. It was a growing middle income class, it was a younger demographic structure and large population. That's the reason why they try to, you know, put their supply chain and the manufacturing branches closer to, you know, their customers. And I think if this is, you know, any reasonable, uh, you know, business ban, uh, would do. Uh, this is a very reasonable decision to make. And you mentioned the new growth point, Professor Chu. So what do you make of the Eurozone's advancement in the tech field? For example, in the global AI development and competition, what's Europe's role in it? Well, they want to catch up. Uh, I think the European Union actually is one of the most developed uh, economy in the whole world. And they never lack of great education, great university, great talents, great scientists. But the only problem is that how can they fund that? And how can they fund that growth sustainably? I know there are many uh, great students graduated from Germany, from France, from Switzerland, and from UK, uh, Cambridge and Oxford. But most of the young people actually ended up finding a job in the Silicon Valley, find it up in the Boston, because they have a better stimulus package. Uh, they will have lower tax, and they will probably have more of the private uh, you know, equity to support the VCs, angels, and the listed uh, you know, system uh, in America. So the brain drain can be a problem. Just take a look what's happened in high tax sectors in the European Union in the past five years or 10 years. Anti-monopoly. The only thing they can do is try to, you know, anti-monopoly of American tech giants, of the tech oligarchs like Facebook, uh, like the Twitter, like the Microsoft. Otherwise, they do not have another weapon. Do they have European uh, WhatsApp? Do they have the European, you know, uh, Alipay or PayPal? Do they have uh, a brand European AI to counterfeit, uh, to counterfeit uh, the American competitors? I don't quite think so. The competition is always good for the market economy, but now they're not doing to their full, uh, full potential. They're not doing to their best. So that's a problem I think Europe are facing right now. Professor Chi Qiang from Mingzhou University of China talking to my colleague Zhao Yang. You're listening to World Today. Stay tuned. Hello, my name is Alessandro Golombievski Teixeira. I'm a professor of public policy and management at Tsinghua University in Beijing. I am a great listener of the world today. In my opinion, the world today is one of the best China radio programs. In the world today, we can get the best news and analysis in what is happening now in the world. So please, come to join us. You're listening to World Today. I'm Ding Han in Beijing. Azerbaijan's foreign ministry says the country has officially applied to join the BRICS grouping. 
The bid follows Azerbaijan's expression of interest at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit held in Astana in early July. The BRICS include Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, with Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates also part of the bloc. It has evolved into a key international forum, organizing annual summits in order to coordinate on various multilateral issues. So, for more, my colleague Liu Quan is joining us in our studio. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, I guess the BRICS has really been endowed with a number of labels over the years. For example, representative of the emerging economies. Nowadays, representatives of the global south, etc., etc. Now, with regard to Azerbaijan, what do you think this country is、uh, is aiming for by applying to become a member here?、Mm. So、uh, Azerbaijan announced on Tuesday in a statement uh, that uh, the country is pushing for membership in BRICS.、Uh, the announcement came after Putin,、uh, Russian President Putin,、uh, paid a state visit. Uh, to the country and had bilateral talks with Azerbaijani President Aliyev.、Um, the two sides signed a few agreements on trade and e- economic cooperation.、Uh, with Azerbaijan's president said,、uh, bilateral economic and trade relations are progressing successfully despite global challenges.、Uh, Russia is also the rotating chair of、uh, this year's uh, BRICS. In seeking BRICS membership, for one thing, Azerbaijan may want to stay relevant on issues that concern all developing economies, because that is the mission of BRICS.、Uh, for another, BRICS mechanism has all all sorts of、uh, resources that Azerbaijan can actually tap into, like the BRICS、uh, New Development Bank,、uh, the Contingency Reserve Arrangements, and also all sorts of、uh, cultural and people-to-people exchange mechanisms. Okay, so、um, correct me if I am wrong. One impression I have about Azerbaijan, this country, is that we are talking about a fossil fuel rich、um, economy. It has close ties with Russia, like you indicated earlier, for sure, because of their historical connections, etc. And nowadays, it appears that this country is also becoming a Very critical energy partner with the EU. There was a deal signed in 2022, etc.、Uh, but but I could be wrong. My memory could be wrong. So if we are talking about a scenario where Azerbaijan is to become a BRICS member, what can Azerbaijan really bring to the table? Right, Azerbaijan has been very active in global issues in recent years.、Uh, it will host this year's COP twenty nine UN climate talks.、Uh, so diplomats and experts, environmental activists will head to Baku for this high profile meeting.、Uh, and you are right.、Uh, the same time, Azerbaijan has become an increasingly critical energy partner for the European Union.、Uh, the two sides. Uh, Azerbaijan has signed a deal in mid 2022 with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen to help、uh, the continent win itself off Russian oil and gas,、uh, especially amid the Russia-Ukraine crisis.、Uh, this fossil fuel-rich state,、um, Azerbaijan, has since become a major trading partner for the European Union. Russia also increasingly depends on countries like Azerbaijan to access global markets because of the sanctions imposed on Moscow over、uh, the Ru- Russia-Ukraine crisis.、Uh, also, this、uh, this region,、uh, which Azerbaijan is located in the South、uh, Caucasus,、uh, is traditionally very crucial in regional geopolitics.、Um, mm. Its location、uh, is at the crossroads of Asia, Europe, the Middle East.、Uh, So it attracts a lot of、uh, geopolitical interest, much bigger、uh, than its size from、uh, neighboring and external powers. Okay. So, by the way,、um, some Southeastern Asian countries、um, like Malaysia and Thailand, they are also very much interested、uh, in terms of joining the BRICS.、Uh, what about their considerations in your in your understanding? Right.、Um, These two nations also expressed interest this year.、Uh, Thailand said、uh, a BRICS membership would enhance Thailand's road, role as a leader among emerging economies.、Uh, the country's、uh, foreign ministry spokesperson told the press that、uh, 
Here I quote:、uh, "The country wants to play more roles, promoting Thai potentials to co-play the roles with developed nations and down- underdeveloped nations to provide guidelines for global community development to promote justice and equality."、Uh, on the other、uh, hand,、uh, Thailand also said,、uh, "Being a BRICS member does not mean Thailand is taking a side."、Um, Also for Malaysia,、uh, Malaysia received the Russian Foreign Minister Sergey Lavrov in July this year.、Um, President Anwar、uh, said. Here I quote again: Our discussion primarily centered on Malaysia's recent application for membership in the BRICS alliance, which Russia currently chairs. This potential membership holds a substantial promise for both nations and underscores our commitment to fostering robust international collaboration.、Uh, And Anwar also said,、uh, "With、uh, Russia together with BRICS,、uh, um, Malaysia will try to explore avenues to enhance、uh, cooperation in key areas such as investment, trade, science, technology, agriculture, tourism,、uh, education, etc."、Uh, appeals in joining the bloc from Malaysia and Thailand are similar to that of、uh, Azerbaijan. Like、uh, better access to BRICS development bank, the contingency reserve arrangements,、uh, etc. Apart from that, these nations are seeking a place in a world、uh, in which U.S. dollar is losing its dominance.、Um, so tensions between great powers have heightened,、uh, and the result is that secondary sanctions are increasingly becoming the tool for United States.、Uh, with this trend,、uh, momentum has grown. Uh, around the world, in terms of、uh, de-dollarization, and these emerging markets like Thailand, Malaysia, definitely want to participate in this process. Also,、uh, BRICS, of course, represent the interest and aspiration of the global South. Uh, uh, the expansion of BRICS, of course, would amplify the choice or the voice of the global South and point to. Uh, for a more, you know, diversity in terms of、um, the econom economy in our world. Yeah. So I guess there is a shared voice from either existing BRICS member countries or those who are interested in joining. That we want development. We want a more equality in our international financial and trade system. So. I mean, since the first foreign ministers gathering back in the year two thousand and six, this mechanism surrounding BRICS has really come a long way.、Um, in addition to all those points you made earlier, what do you think the the mechanism has achieved?、Mm. So、uh, in two thousand one, British economist Jim O'Neill first brought up the term BRIC.、Uh, BRICS. Which is an acronym for、uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa was launched in 2009.、Uh, later, renamed BRICS in 2010 when South Africa joined the group.、Uh, it was formed to foster economic, political, cultural cooperation among these members.、Uh, actually, when he first put forward the idea, Jim O'Neill's point was that、uh, the global governance system would need in the future to adjust. To incorporate the world's largest emerging economies, I mean today、um, uh, the figures from last year showed that、uh, the five countries combined accounted for GDP of twenty five point eight trillion U.S. dollars, or about a quarter of the global total.、Uh, the group of seven G seven developed nations have a combined forty six point eight trillion dollars.、Mm. Um, that says a lot about、uh, the growth of these countries over. The years and、uh, for the NDB, the New Development Bank,、uh, according to the 2020 annual report,、um, the bank、uh, focused on assisting member countries in dealing with crisis and following economic recovery.、Um, it was reflected by its board of governors approving an emergency line of up to 10 billion U.S. dollars to assist uh, these uh, BRICS states as well as intra-BRICS、uh, cooperation. Uh, during COVID nineteen pandemic, and、uh, mm. of course the contingency reserve arrangement has、uh, about one hundred billion dollars、uh, that people can use during you know times of、uh, crisis and financial turmoil. These are the main achievements、uh, this mechanism has made、uh, during the past years. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. That was my colleague Liu Kun. You are listening to World Today. We'll be back.
You are listening to World Today. I'm Ding Hanin, Beijing. China has called on all parties in Libya to strengthen dialogue and a consultation to break the political deadlock. Dai Bing, China's deputy permanent representative to the UN, made the remark in a Tuesday UN Security Council meeting regarding the situation in Libya. The Chinese diplomat said all parties in the country should make should take rather a national reconciliation conference to be held in October as an opportunity to inject new impetus into the political transition. Libya plunged into chaos after a NATO-backed uprising toppled longtime leader Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. The country is now divided between rival administrations in the east and west. And the top UN official regarding Libyan affairs warned in this particular Tuesday meeting that the political, military, and the security situation in the country has deteriorated rapidly over the past two months. So joining us now on the line is He Wenping, Africa expert and a senior research fellow with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, thank you for having me. So,、yeah. what do you think has really paved way to what what this UN official calls as the rapid recent deterioration in the political and military and security situation in Libya?、Uh, I think,、uh, of course, the major、uh, reason behind this、uh, deterioration is、uh, remain、uh, the lack of、uh, mutual trust,、uh, not only.、Uh, Political mutual trust, and also、uh, even those standoffs between the two east and west,、uh, those governments, the military forces. You know, in the recent、uh, one month, also uh, suddenly, uh, like uh, you know, the the west administration led by the general、uh, Haftar, and、mm. suddenly made、uh, the unilateral unilateral military force mobilization and、uh, even marching towards、uh, the southwest part. So that immediately caused a very, you know, big alert and response coming from、uh, those military guys、uh, used to in control of the southwest. So, seems、uh, a big military confrontation will take take again. So、yeah. that's why、uh, international mediator and then a, a lot of、uh, even relevant countries around、uh, all, you know, put on alert、mm. and then even. Uh, this tension building even goes as far as to Algeria, another neighbor country, because they have some、uh, disputed territory、uh, between them. So that's why United Nations,、uh, you know, they're calling for stop、uh, those unilateral suddening so the military force、uh, mobilization that is very dangerous、uh, for now. Very hard moving forward this political process.、Mm. And、uh, like I mentioned earlier. There is to be this national reconciliation conference to be held in mid October regarding the situation in Libya. So, do you think political dialogue, consultation, or national reconciliation is likely in the near future? And by the way, Professor He, when we talk about all those chaos and tragedy that has happened in Libya, either currently or over the past one decade or so, do you think our international community? Can hold anyone or any country accountable for for all those tragedies? Well, I'm not that、uh, optimistic at all for the near future. Those, uh, uh, you know, national reconciliation dialogue、uh, for the Libya case. Yeah, because you're talking, you see that, that area in Africa, not only Libya and then Sudan. You see the Sudan, the civil war also has been there for、yeah. quite a long time, and also a lot of efforts、uh, today, tomorrow, and then some meeting here, some meeting there. So always ended up in failure. The key key、uh, factor preventing those peace talks forward is that because those two fighting partners like Sudan similar, because either of them they don't think they are going to lose uh, this uh, this uh, you know upper hand. They、yeah. think they can win、uh, from those fighting on the ground. So they are not saying oh we have been defeated completely. So surrender. That's the only way. Maybe can get something something back from negotiation table. But now it's not only. Uh, those two now cannot say who is the、uh, upper hand because they all got some outside supporters now, like Libya,、mm. while this uh, uh, you know West Park General Haftar.、Uh, even recently, I got the information saying they got a new tank, those military weapon, saying from Russia. This、uh, Wagner, you know, Wagner, this、yeah. uh, missionary army now is supporting uh, this uh, General Haftar, 
and then that uh, uh, east, uh, this uh, so-called UN recognized uh, this administration, they got support from the United States. Also, get a very strong support from Turkey. Mm. So you see, not only they are fighting with each other, also they got both they got uh, those outside support. That's why it's not that easy uh, to reach uh, this uh, reconciliation mm. uh, in the negotiation table. Mm, sounds like there is a proxy war going on over there with all those、uh, meddling from external powers. Now,、uh, Professor He,、uh, we understand some media reports suggests that China has been making a tentative comeback to Libya in most recent years. I guess most specifically, we are talking about some Chinese investors or Chinese corporations. So, in your assessment. In what areas can China deliver support and assistance to Libya nowadays, and what areas might be beyond the capability of China alone? Oh yes,、uh, now in recent years,、uh, even the Libya that uh, uh, international recognized government also、uh, their leader came to China like to join China Arabic Cooperation Forum,、mm-hmm. and then they offer the promise saying. Ah,、uh, we sincerely invite Chinese company go back to help Libya to do the post-conflict reconstruction. Yeah, it did. Some Chinese company now they eager back to Libya because they used to have many projects there before the Colonel Gaddafi being killed.、Mm. So they want to continue、uh, this project. But we also、uh, have done something like uh, uh, humanitarian assistance to Libya. For example, like last year when Libya suffered from flood. Uh, like tsunami, and、uh, so China offered、uh, you know as, as much as thirty、uh, million RMB,、uh, those、uh, humanitarian assistance,、uh, material, those things、uh, to help those people now suffering from those natural disaster. But、uh, what other things we cannot do? I think is is how to bring them uh, into uh, to form uh, like a, a reconciliation. Now stop fighting. Now you are together. So those things you see, even the United Nations special envoy and all kinds of those international、uh, framework has been doing so long time,、mm. ever since 2011 until、yeah. now. Yeah, all the efforts have been there, but it's very hardly.、Mm. Let's be patient and really hope for the best for this in African country. But thank you very much. That was Dr. He Wenping joining us from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. That's all the time for this edition of the program. I'm Ding Han in Beijing. Thank you so much for listening. Bye for now.